All right, good evening, everybody. I see uh, our attendees are coming in. Um, so we will be getting started with our webinar here in about uh, two minutes. And uh, thank you for joining us for tonight's webinar on archery turkey hunting. Uh, we will be uh, covering some topics to help you with this archery season that's coming up. And actually it is live right now. You can be hunting with archery equipment during the general season, but uh, what we will cover is to help you try and be successful uh, in your pursuits with archery turkey hunting. So thank you for coming on. Um, I'm gonna give it about two minutes before we actually start tonight's webinar. Um, all our questions will be answered through the question answer function. So please feel free to ask any questions in that area. There should be on the bottom of your viewing screen, a uh, question answer button, Q and A. If you ask us questions, we should be able to answer them either live during our webinar or um, privately or, you know, in a response back from my many, many panelists that are helping out with tonight. So tonight we're uh, joined with a couple of very special bow hunters that are actually our bow hunter ed instructors also, and they're going to be helping us out with this topic. And we will have a wildlife officer um, with us tonight too, who will help us answer some uh, laws and reg questions. So thank you for coming on. And like I said, we'll be starting in another minute or two. All right. Um, just so you know, I, the next plant webinar is for, um, I think it's April 22nd. It's in two weeks from tonight. Um, it will be on applying for big game tags please make sure you check that out. Uh, a lot of people have a different idea and view of how it works, thinking your name gets drawn out of a hat and either you get your first choice or your second choice or your third, if that one's not available. That is not in fact how it works. Uh, you'll be surprised. So please come on board um, for that webinar if you haven't signed up already. Uh, it should help you a lot if you're interested in big game hunting. All right, I expected some more uh, coming in tonight. Hopefully they'll be coming in soon and we can get started with our webinar. I'm gonna give it one more minute and then we'll get started. Right now I'm gonna go ahead and activate the poll, uh, first poll of the night. Um, this is gonna be able to help us determine who we have on board with us tonight um, as far as what our um, attendees are, what their experiences. So uh, panelists, you can also vote. So here goes the first poll. Uh, first poll is, have you harvested a turkey yet this season? Um, turkey season actually started on March 27th and you've had a couple of weekends to get out there into the field and, and pursue some turkeys. So just curious how many people actually have gotten turkeys so far. And right now it's looking like a resounding five. Not too great, but hey, we'll, we'll get there. All right. So as people are coming in still, um, I'm gonna close it in uh, three, two, one. All right. Um, so here we are, the results. Have you harvested a turkey yet this season? Only five answered yes, uh, 50 answered no, and 59 have answered haven't hunted yet. All right. Uh, Tommy wants to know how many people are attending. Uh, there's 120 right now so far as attendees, Tommy. So uh, yeah, we're, we were expecting more. We have a lot more registered and maybe they'll come in a little bit later. All right. One more, uh, one more poll before we get started. Have you ever harvested anything with a boat? Um, Here's the question, have you ever harvested anything with a bow? Yes and no. Let's give it uh, some time here. All right, we have some successful bow harvesters. Uh, our, our panel will be interested in this. Okay, I'm gonna give it three, two, one, and share my results with you guys. So, 30% or 36 of you have said yes, and 83 or 70% of you have said no. 
So we have a lot of people out here with not having success with uh, a bow yet, whether they haven't uh, used one or they just haven't had luck uh, harvesting an animal. Um, we'll see how that goes later. So, all right. So introduce you to introduce you to tonight's panel. We have uh, Robert Moore. Robert Moore has uh, been big uh, bow hunting, big game and small game since the mid eighties. Uh, he has served as a bow hunter education instructor since 1993. And Robert has also served as a state legislative coordinator for California Bowmen Hunters uh, State Archery Association since 2010. Uh, John Waddles, um, John, can you give us a wave there? You can see him and his, his uh, trophies back there. Uh, John, actually, I want to tell him thank you for his service to our nation. He spent 20 years in the Air Force as a mechanic and 26 years in civil service. Uh, he is presently our California International Bow Hunter Education Program Chairman. Uh, he has been teaching bow hunter education for 43 years in California. And Johnny has been shooting target archery and bow hunting for 53 years and has been shooting bows since before the compound bow was invented. Thanks, Johnny, for that information. Uh, Warden Chris Girdich. Uh, Warden Girdich has been in uh, Mariposa County as of late. He's worked for the department for nine years. He hunts about everything you can hunt, including turkeys, and has taken a handful of turkeys with his bow. And he enjoys taking kids to the blind as well as helping others get their first turkeys. So those are our panelists for tonight. Thank you, gentlemen, for joining us. Uh, appreciate you joining us for this topic. And uh, I'd like to go ahead and tell people how we're going to proceed with tonight's uh, um, webinar. So there's our panelists up close and in, in their uh, pride of pictures. Uh, I didn't get the full picture of uh, Robert's six by six bull there, but he has a nice Idaho bull that he harvested. Very nice animal. And uh, we'll see how that goes. Sorry, I need to stop sharing my results. Um, our talking points for tonight, we're gonna to talk about laws and regulations. We're gonna talk about equipment, such as the bows, arrows, uh, broadheads, calls, decoys, uh, blinds, our hunting setups in general, uh, shot placement, which is um, very, very nice to uh, see that, you know, we're, that's very vital to making, having successful hunt. Uh Sean, bird recovery. Yes, I don't believe you're sharing what I'm not sharing my screen, am I? All right, thank you. I have missed up on that one. Thank you for that. There it is. I'll go back one. Let me go back. All right, there's our panelist. I'm sorry, gentlemen and ladies. Uh, we've uh, I've had a little snafu. All right, so there's our panelists. There's his bow. Everybody wants to see your elk, Robert. That's what it was. <laughs> and uh, there's Johnny with the, one of his hunting partners uh, taken by Bo, uh, some turkeys, and here we go. So once again, here's our talking points for tonight. And right now at this point, I'm gonna go ahead and release my share to uh, Chris so he can cover laws and regulations. Okay. All right, that pop up? Yes. All right, so we got laws and regulations, like uh, Sean mentioned. I'm a game warden. I patrol Mariposa, Merced counties right now, and we're going to go over a uh, bunch of good stuff tonight. All right, so when it comes to laws and regulations, there's a lot of different stuff. Some of the most common violations we're going to talk about tonight, uh, which include uh, having no header wing attached, hunting within 150 yards of a dwelling, use of bait, shooting from roadways, uh, the different shooting hours for turkeys, use uh, the electric calls for turkeys, and uh, some of the authorized methods to take in hunter trespass. Uh, I put the sections down at the bottom of each page on the bottom left when we talk about this. That way you guys can jot it down or have it later um, to look back on. Uh, 
All right, so licenses and validations. What do you need when you're out there getting ready to go hunt a turkey? Okay, so for adults, you need your hunting license and then you need your upland game bird validation. Uh, for those of you that haven't hunted in a few years, we got not rid of the stamps, but we've turned into a validation, which shows up on your hunting license. It nearly says upland game bird validation, but you are still entitled to your stamps. Um, you don't have to put them on your license anymore, but if you check the box saying you want your stamps sent to you, later in the year, your stamps will show up and you can collect them um, and save them for years to come. When it comes to kids, hunters 16 and older need a valid license and upland game bird validation. Hunters under 16 need only junior license. And to qualify, the hunter must be less than 16 years of age at the beginning of the license year, which starts on July 1st. Hunting licenses go from July 1st to July 31st. Okay, so for spring, we have a couple different times you can hunt. So we have a early junior season, which is March 20th to the 21st, which is for juniors only. Then we roll into our general season, which is March 27th through May 2nd. During that time, uh, most people shoot with shotguns, um, but you could also use a crossbow or your uh, archery equipment during general season. After general season, we have a late junior season and a adult archery season, which runs from May 3rd until May 16th. During that time, adults um, have to use archery equipment only. Uh, juniors hunting during that time can use archery equipment if they like, or they can stick to their crossbow or their shotgun. When it comes to shooting hours during spring season, it is from one half hour before sunrise to 5 p.m. Okay, we, we cut it short in the end of the day. That way the turkeys have time to get back up to their roosts, hens have time to get to their nests. I um, mean, it just takes off some pressure in the afternoon um, on those turkeys. Okay, so what is legal during the 2021 spring season? What can you shoot? So to shoot a turkey during spring season, they have to have a visible beard. The limit is one bearded turkey per day, three turkeys per spring season. Now, hens also get a beard, which you can shoot during this time, because if you know, it doesn't say only male turkeys, it says turkeys with a beard. So hens with a beard, Jake's with a beard, Tom's with a beard, those are all legal to take. Any young turkey that doesn't have a beard or hen without a beard, Gotta let those go until fall season. Okay, so after you shoot your turkey, how are you supposed to transport it? You have to have a fully feathered wing or head attached and keep that beard on your turkey during spring turkey season when transporting. What this means is transporting from the field to your house, it's gotta have head, wing or head, head or wing and beard attached or if you're going to a friend's house or you're going to a processor, you have to have those things on it until you get there. Once you're at your house and you're processing it, whether it's gonna go straight onto your smoker or it's going in your freezer, at that point, you can fully clean it. And the reason for that is, is if you get stopped by a game warden, we wanna be able to verify that the bird that you have in your possession was a legally taken bird with a beard. Okay, hunting from blinds and using decoys are allowed um, and you can use those to assist you in your take. We're gonna be talking a little bit more in detail about that um, in a couple more slides. Okay, the use of live decoys is prohibited when taking wild turkeys. What this means is don't go grab your neighbor's, you know, farm raised turkey, tie a string to it, tie it to a tree. Um, I'm sure it would work really well, but you definitely can't do it. Any decoy that you're using has got to be your standard plastic decoy or you know, a decoy that you stuffed yourself. As long as it's not alive, you can use it. Okay, no hunting within 150 yards of an occupied dwelling or outbuilding without written permission. The reason for this is it's a safety zone. 
Okay, if you have neighbors and they're within 150 yards of you and they don't you know, like hunting, they don't expect you to be hunting and they're out in their backyard and you happen to be within 150 yards and you shoot towards them, your arrow potentially could go and injure them. So if you get permission, you could hunt within 150 yards. But if you don't have permission from a neighbor or a building in the woods or anything you come across that looks like is possibly occupied, you have to be more than 150 yards away from that. Your own, your own property, it's different because obviously you don't need permission to hunt your own property um, and be within 150 yards of your own house. Uh, just make sure that if you are hunting in areas that are, have houses and people and you do have permission to be within 150 yards of those, give them the heads up and say, hey, I'm going hunting tomorrow, tonight, whenever. Um, that way, the people that live there aren't running around or riding bicycles or doing anything uh, unsafe while you're hunting. Okay, when you're out hunting and you come across private property, be looking for land that is fenced, land that is posted three signs to a mile, or land that is under cultivation. If you come across any of these and you don't have written permission to hunt on that land, you cannot. There is certain areas like BLM, Forest Service, where you can generally go and you're not gonna run across you know, fences or signs or cultivation because that's public land for you to utilize. Same thing with fishing game properties. Those, we do have special programs where you can go out and hunt on our properties or on federal land, but even still on those, you have to have some sort of written permission. If you come across a piece of property that's under cultivation, that has a fence or is posted and you would like to hunt it, go knock on the door of the landowner and ask permission. They may give it to you. If the landowner says, yeah, you can hunt my property, have them write it down on a piece of paper, giving you physical written permission that way, if you get stopped on their property by a game warden, you can present this to that and we'll let you go about your, your business and go about hunting. Hey, Chris, just really quick. There was a question about how big does your property have to be to hunt on it? Is there any size requirement? There's no size requirement per se. Um, you just have to make sure that wherever your property is, whether it's you know, in a township, inside city limits, inside, surrounded by forest, you just have to make sure that you can hunt on that property. And if there is a neighbor within 150 yards of your property, go get permission from them to discharge your bow within 150 yards of them. Um, if you're in the middle of the city that doesn't allow the discharge of firearms or archery equipment, then you wouldn't be able to hunt your property. If you're in a rural place like Mariposa County, like I am, majority of the properties up here you'd be fine hunting it okay thank you yes there was another question about how to get written permission from blm or other fenced public land you don't need to have written permission from public land so uh but as long as you're legal to hunt there uh if it's your private property and that you've got reached your safety um definition the safety zone then you should be legal to hunt and the only other thing I would add to that is if you're on BLM or Forest Service and you come to a gate or a fence and your Onyx map shows, hey, this is BLM, but for some reason it says no trespass on the fence, contact whatever office is nearest to you for that BLM or Forest Service and ask them if you are allowed to hunt there or if you can pass through because um, it may be posted illegally or they might have some sort of special grazing rights with that farmer that's leasing the BLM land out of Forest Service out. Um, to protect their livestock. So if you if you don't know, um, try and get a hold of them or get a hold of a game warden, and we can usually track that down for you and try and get you the correct answer. Okay, thank you. Okay, electronically operated calls or sound reproduction devices are prohibited when attempting to take wild turkeys. What this means is you can't have anything battery powered playing a turkey call. You can't be blasting your radios you know, um, truck radios, car radio, portable radios, cell phones, can't have anything that runs like that emitting turkey sounds. Um, we're gonna go over in a little bit the different type of calls to use, but they're all gonna be fully operated by your hands or by your mouth. All right, so no firearms allowed this is pertaining to is archers hunting wild turkey during the late season archery 
may not possess a firearm while in the field unless they are active or retired peace officers or in possession of a concealed firearms permit. So if it's the late archery only season, you can't have a firearm unless you meet that criteria. The other thing involved with this is since the junior season and the late archery are at the same time, if you're an adult taking your child out, your child can still hunt with a firearm and be with you as long as you're using your bow. Um, just don't obviously take his gun and shoot a turkey. Okay, so while you're hunting for turkeys, only broadheads may be used while hunting. And they must measure seven eighths of an inch or greater. Mechanical retractable broadheads shall be measured in the open position. Well, this means if you take a tape measure, take your broadhead of choice that you'd like to use, which we're going to talk about a bunch of different types of broadheads here in a little bit, and you measure the widest part of the cutting area. So from tip to tip sideways, if your broadhead reaches wider than seven eighths of an inch, it's legal to use. If it's shorter than seven eighths, um, that means it's too small to use. Most broadheads are generally going to be over that. Um, they even come up to two inches now in some of the guillotines, you know, you're looking three, four inches. Okay, so crossbows are not legal methods to take during the archery season, unless you're in possession of a disabled archer's permit. Crossbows can be used during the general season. Pretty straightforward, unless you have a disabled archer's permit, you can only use your crossbow during general and not during the late archery season. Okay, hunting wild turkeys over bait is illegal. If you come across a big pile of corn on the ground, a feeder like what's in the picture, or grain scattered across an area where there was no grain field, um, farmers don't plant seeds this way. It's a telltale sign that somebody is trying to attract the turkeys with bait. It's highly illegal. Um, don't hunt over it. And if you happen to come across something that looks suspicious or you think's baited, definitely give us a call and we'll, we'll come and investigate. Okay, so remember, discharging a firearm or releasing an arrow or crossbow bolt across or from a road is a violation. So Fish and Game Code and Penal Code cover these. So what this is talking about is most people, when they go hunting for turkeys, they go out in the woods, they hike around, they get off the road and get away from the roads. But there are those people that go and road hunt which is not illegal in California, and they see a turkey. If you see a turkey on the side of the road and you step out of your vehicle and shoot from that roadway, it's a violation. The laws for California require that you step off the roadway. There's no distance requirement. You just have to be off the maintained portion of the road. Also, don't shoot over the road. So if you come to a road and you're on one side, then there's the road and a turkey on the other side, you cannot shoot your arrow across that road at that turkey. You have to walk across the road, make sure you're off the road, and then if that turkey's on land you have permission to hunt, you can take the turkey at that time. This is obviously for safety. Uh, you don't want to, you know, injure somebody bicycling, walking, hiking down the road, or even driving down the road. Always make sure you guys know what you're shooting at too before you release your arrow. Okay, so the last thing is our cow tip program. A lot of people are familiar with this. If you actually look on the back of your hunting or fishing license, the cow tip number and instructions are on the back. What cow tip is, it's a way to report uh, poachers and polluters. So if you witness a poaching or polluting incident or any fish and wildlife violation, or you have information about such a violation, immediately dial the toll free cow tip number on your screen, 1 334 cow tip. It's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Or you can submit an anonymous tip to us using tip411. Tip411 is an internet-based tool from citizenobserve.com that enables the public to text messages, text message, an anonymous tip to wildlife officers to let the officers respond back by creating an anonymous two-way conversation. Anyone with a cell phone may send an anonymous tip to us by texting CALTIP followed by a space and the message to the 847411, which is TIP411. The third way of doing this, you can download a free CalTIP smartphone app, which operates just like TIP411 by creating an anonymous two-way conversation with wildlife officers 
to report wildlife and pollution violations. The CalTIP app can be downloaded for free via the Google Play Store and iTunes App Store. What this means is there's three different ways for you to turn in somebody poaching or polluting. We get cow tips all the time. The way it works is somebody calls, like it says on the screen, it goes to either a wildlife officer in charge of the program or the dispatch. And you say, hey, I'm in Mariposa County. I just witnessed this. The big thing is, is you wanna put as much information down as you can. Description of the person, type of vehicle, license plate of the vehicle is always fantastic. Which way they went, what they shot or what they polluted or what they caught that was illegal just everything you can think of that goes to either that officer or a dispatch. And then they look on their list and go, all right, who works in Mariposa County? They go, Hey, Chris does. I get a phone call going, Hey, this cow tip just came in from Sean. Sean left his phone number. I give Sean a call. He explains what's going on. We have a record of it. I respond and hopefully we're able to catch him. If it turns into something that is a significant case, there's also rewards money that is put aside. Um, to help as an incentive for, for you guys doing this. All right, Chris. Um, there were a couple of questions that came in law regulated, uh, laws and regulation related. Um, okay. Person's talking about, you know, how some of the broadheads we'll talk about later decapitate the bird. Should we keep the head with the rest of that carcass in the cooler? Is it required? Head or wing attached. So if you chop the head off, Make sure you have that wing attached and uh, the beard still on the bird. Yep. Um, if we do, we have to leave the head or wing attached or in beard if we are camping on a hunting trip. Yes. So until you get back to your personal abode, or if you get back to your campsite and later that night you're going to cook up turkey, you can be in the process of processing that turkey as long as you're going to immediately be eating it. So immediately is, hey, I'll get back to my camp. I'm gonna process it right now. I'm gonna throw it in some milk. I'm gonna throw it in some butter. I'm gonna season it and I'm cooking it tonight. At that point, you'd be able to clean your turkey. And if we came into camp, it would all be legal. Okay, how about uh, is our flu flu arrows required for archery turkey hunting? No, they're not. And I believe John will talk about that a little bit, a little bit later. Yep. All right, well, thanks. Uh, you gave me back the screen. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen again. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I'm sure if we have more questions, please make sure you use the question answer function for questions. Don't use the chat. Uh, the chat questions can get lost in the conversations. Uh, please use the question answer. That way they get addressed by us as um, um, panelists, okay? So please, please do that. And by my screen another question just came in sean about string trackers i'm assuming he's talking about the light up knocks yeah which... we can uh string trackers are a little bit different and johnny can talk about that uh okay. in a second so uh one more quick poll so before we get started with the next section um here we go with it so i own a compound bow uh recurve bow both compound and recurve, neither compound nor recurve. Okay, got 148 participants going tonight. Thank you for joining us. Again, make sure you uh, sign up for our next one on the 22nd for big game tags. And here we go. I'm gonna share the results. Sorry if you didn't get to put it in. A lot of you own compound bows, so appreciate that. Uh, recurves. All those purchases of archery equipment go into what is called the Pittman Robertson Fund, which helps wildlife conservation. Uh, you don't realize that just buying the equipment, you're actually helping uh, wildlife by uh, all those excise taxes that come back to our agency, help uh, improve habitat and purchase lands. So you're doing a lot as conservation uh, as, as hunters. So. Thank you for that. Uh, that was the last poll I wanted to show for this time. And what we'll do is go on to the next slide. Start with our talking points. So we're gonna talk about bows, uh, recurve and compound. Um, 
I, I have here, why not longbows? Robert, can you help me out with that? Would a longbow be appropriate for most turkey hunting situations? Oh, it can be, it uh, falls in line with the recurve. Um, in general, both the recurve and the longbow are, are longer. So if you're in a blind, you wanna make sure you have room for that bow to be drawn and not hit the sides, which will disrupt the arrow flight, plus make noise. So it is appropriate. Just takes mm -hmm. a little bit more effort to shoot it accurately. Yeah, so thinking about bows and how people are gonna be hunting uh, turkeys, most time it's probably gonna be some type of blind or concealment. So thinking more shorter axle or end-to-end -end type of bows would be appropriate. Um, you guys have a preference, you, Robert, or is Johnny still on our, our thing here? Yes. There he is. All right, there he is. Johnny, you have any preference between uh, any of the bows? I, I prefer, uh, I, I have shot all the bows uh, uh, hunting wise, but for, uh, for turkey, uh, I prefer uh, a compound because I'm either sitting on the ground, close to the ground, or I'm in an enclosed blind, and uh, you just got more movability with the, with the compound. Yeah, um, definitely. And what else do you get out of the advantage of using that compound? Well, uh, when a turkey comes in, uh, he might hang up. And because of the uh, let off and the way the compounds are designed, uh, you can hold a little longer uh, and we'll wait for him to present a, uh, a shot. No, Chris, there aren't any regulations that would uh, preclude somebody from using any of these type of bows, are there? What is there a requirement? Uh, was it thirty or forty pounds now? Um, it's I think it's thirty. The the, the minimum bow weight I think it's thirty pounds. Yeah, I believe that's correct. Yeah, so thirty pounds. As long as your bow's thirty pounds or over, then uh, you're good to go. Anything under that would be considered too light. Okay, great, great. Uh, any other uh, news that we can give them or information uh, related to the bows themselves? Uh, before we move on to broadheads and arrows, gentlemen. I would say just go get go get fitted to fitted. something that's going to be appropriate to you at your local you know, Bass Pro or Sportsman's. Exactly. You, you don't really ever want to borrow a bow from somebody. Uh, bows are specific and match to the person using them. So that is definitely a good addition. Uh, we teach that in our basic hunter education class that you want to make sure your equipment is matched uh, not only just to the uh, equipment wise, but uh, through the size of the shooter, whoever's handling the, the uh, bow. All right. A lot, a lot of guys, uh, uh, when they talk to use their bows, they use the same bow for uh, that were they use to shoot big game with. Uh, and in doing so, they either need to maybe lower the poundage a little bit because uh, you want to keep the, the uh, be able to keep the arrow in the in the animal. So uh, 45 to 50, whatever, if you get over that, uh, your, your arrow is going through the bird. Plus, if you have to hold for a long period of time, uh, you could get uh, uh, tired and, and not be able to uh, get a, a decent shot or a correct shot. Yeah. Yeah, fatigue can definitely lead to bad shots um, holding back that bow. So having that nice let off on a compound really can help your shooting accuracy. Um, broadheads, I have here broadheads give you broad choices. There's uh, a myriad of broadheads that are used for uh, turkey hunting. Some of actually have the name of, you know, gobbler getter, uh, turkey decapitator, all kinds of different stuff like that. So uh, both, all of you guys, I'd like you to, to weigh in on this. Johnny, what, what uh, broadhead do you find effective for yourself? And uh, I know you had some you showed us the other day uh, that might help the audience. Can you, can you see them? Yes, we can. Okay. I, I, I like a, a three braided broadhead, uh, something like this a Thunderhead. Uh, it's made by uh, NAP. They also make this one right here, which is an old, uh, the uh, first generation uh, Spitfire. Well, no, the, the first generation mechanical. Where the blades, when they when it hits, the blades cam open like so versus uh, slide back like that uh, at rage area in the center. Uh, 
and the the young person or the question that earlier we was talking about the uh, uh, the string tracker. I don't know if you can see see this is a uh, uh, a canister that you would put on the bow. Uh, it has a has a string on it. You would tie it like right. You can see that little hook right there to the arrow, and uh, and and use that as a string tracker. They're they're all legal in California. It. Uh, you can't take really long shots on it because the longer the, the shot, the more string you're pulling out and it, it, it affects the uh, your kinetic energy of the arrow and slows it down. So if you use a tracker, you want to take uh, shorter shorter shots. And, and if you use a single bladed or I would call a double bladed broadhead like, like say this one here, uh, some folks put um, uh, a washer behind it so that uh, it, it goes in, but the washer slows the arrow down and keeps the arrow in the bird. Uh, behind this three-bladed broadhead here, I have uh, what's called some judo springs that grabs the meat and, and as it goes in and, and slows, slows the arrow down to keep the arrow in the bird. If the arrow stays with the bird, uh, he has less tendency to, to run off and, and, and fly. So I think the NAA, not the NAA, the National Turkey Federation prefers the uh, arrow uh, in the in the bird versus a, sh a shoot through. <laughs> <laughs> Thank oh you, boy! <laughs> How about you, Robert? You have any uh, preferences? Have you used uh, the same equipment that John does, or do you have other preferences for heads? Yeah, I, I just stick this one broad head that I use for all game, basically. Um, basically, it's a it's a four bladed uh, slick trick. And um, it's got a good diameter on it and it flies good. Um, I think that's um, you know, really important that their equipment flies straight and accurate. And uh, since I, it's, there's other things to do besides worry about equipment. Once you get it set up, just shoot that and then worry about your calling and finding birds and stuff too. So that's what I prefer. How about you, Chris? Do you have a favorite? I mean, I, I've shot them with both the uh, mechanical and um, fixed the uh, blades and it's work the, the one that i'm excited to is i i got some of the guillotines here i don't know if you can see them the big you know like four inch wide i haven't shot one with it yet but uh it's definitely going on an arrow here pretty soon <laughs> yeah. now johnny mentioned the use of those guillotines uh or you mentioning is very important johnny about those using one of those because of the blades are are so long uh if you if you shoot an arrow that's say 28 inches long or whatever it is long, you might want to uh, leave your arrow shaft a little longer because when you draw the draw that bow, if your broadhead comes in back into your bow, those blades can hit your bow and, and, and cause you to, to short draw. So you might have to have a little longer arrow and then and then and practice with it because uh, I have shot the guillotine, but they are definitely a, a short distance kind of broadhead. Yes. And then myself, I've got these gobbler getters that uh, uh, are mentioned here. Um, I bought these on Camo Fire. I'm not trying to advertise for them, but I, they were 16 bucks versus normally 39. So it's, that's a good website. Uh, paid less than half price. So that's what's going to go on my arrows uh, next weekend when I go turkey hunting. And I hope that I'll get some good results. It's got that opening cam, like uh, Johnny said, opens back rearward and gives a nice channel and puts a lot of uh, kinetic energy into the animal. So uh, that's broadheads. Uh, I'm not sure if there's any questions. Let me see what part of Turkey. We will get into shooting uh, areas later uh, when it comes to uh, where you're going to aim your, your shot placement. Um, barbs are okay. As Johnny said, the barb is meant to uh, with Joe's judo springs are meant to uh, slow down the arrow and keep it into the the animal um, so the bird is not a requirement to ensure that the arrow stays in the bird it's just that it may help you with tracking the bird especially if you have lighted knocks uh, such as the luminock um, uh, or if you had a string uh, attached to it to help you follow that string uh, to the bird. Okay. Um, some people are asking about how you practice shooting broadheads. What should you shoot into? Now, broadheads, sometimes some of them come with practice points that will be not as razor sharp. They'll just have the fins that'll uh, replicate the, the arrow flight. 
um, they'll be less, they'll be, uh, they'll be as the same way as if it were in closed mode and they won't be sharp. So it'll allow you to have a safe time with that and not dole your, ra your razor sharp uh, broadheads. Sometimes you have to sacrifice a razor sharp broadhead, make that your practice um, head and shoot that to see how it flies in your, um, in your, your bow. Um, website that I got the gobbler getters uh, that changes now and then it's like a daily it changes hour to hour but that was camo fire and uh, let's go on to the next topic arrows um, are there any specific type of arrows I know uh, you might tell people that they are made out of different materials Johnny uh, let's talk a little bit in general about arrows and, and requirements we should think about for turkey hunting uh, when you pick your arrow, whether it be wood, aluminum, or, or carbon, or a combination of, of aluminum and carbon, just make sure your arrows are spined for the poundage of your bow. If you're shooting a 50-pound bow, make sure you get an arrow that's, sp that's spined for the, uh, uh, the, the poundage. And the materials that we know of uh, that people are commonly getting are aluminum, carbon, uh, wood. Wood ones wouldn't be used with any type of uh, most co compound bows yeah. are too. Yeah, uh, yeah. The, the wood, the wood, the wood arrows are are not recommended for compound bows. Yeah. Recurves and long bows. Gotcha. Anything else to add to that, Robert? We should consider. Um, as John mentioned, if you are going to use the guillotine, make sure it's long enough, and that, and when you extend the length of it, it changes the spine. So you want to double check you're still within the spine limits of, of what you need for that bow. So double check that if you're going to do that. Yeah, a lot of people are fascinated with the guillotine um, arrow, I mean, arrow, uh, broadhead, um, but it does require a little bit more special attention when using. All right. Calls, talking turkey. Everybody likes to talk turkey. Um, the importance of calls, you know, you need to practice, 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 uh, and Especially as a bow hunter, you want to keep your hands free because it requires the use of, you know, both hands. You know, you got to draw, draw the bow, hold the, hold your, uh, your arrow in place in, in, in its sweet spot. So learning how to use diaphragm calls. Uh, Johnny gave us a good demonstration the other day. I'm not sure if he's uh, willing to do it again. Let's see how he goes. He talks turkey well. Johnny's, Johnny's the turkey killer. Um, definitely learn how to use those. They're, they're not very expensive calls. Uh, a lot of times when you first grab one and try to use it, you're going to spit all over the place. It's going to come flying out of your mouth. Um, it takes a little skill, a little practice, and you can't just keep them forever and rely. I don't know how long your diaphragm calls have lasted you, Johnny, but sometimes those little rubbers that they're made out of can uh, rot and get bad so yeah i keep i keep all mine in a, in a little small in a case that you know that little small square case mm -hmm. and if and if uh after you use it before you uh put them away uh dry them if you put them away wet uh, they could mold and, and rot away but yeah always make sure that they're dry when you put them away yeah so they can last you longer that way but if you put them away somewhere and it's somewhere hot. If you leave them in your truck, you may find that the rubbers, the, the diaphragm part will tear and rip and then you'll be without a call. Um, the other calls are great for locating and getting attention, but you may have to learn how to finish with the diaphragm call. Do um, you guys have any preferences for any of those uh, when you're starting your hunt? You got calls you mean? Yes. Uh, I, I like to use, uh, when I'm starting the hunt, I like to use a, a box call. It, it has a more booming sound and it reaches out a lot, you know, a lot farther trying to locate the birds. Uh, and then as they, uh, as they uh, get in close to where they're uh, getting in the shooting range, I'll, I'll go to my mouth call. Um, okay, and uh, locator calls, what, what's the best locator call? Robert, what do you have to use? Have you tried any of the other ones, like a crow or an owl, or you just start off with some turkey yelps? Uh, no, I'll start out with an owl, um, but I'll also use a diaphragm to uh, simulate like a coyote yelp. 
Mm. Um, and then like John, I'll switch to the box call and I use the slate a lot, um, especially if they're out there at that hundred yards, but I'll intermix that with the diaphragm. So when they do get it close, they're already familiar with the diaphragm, but now I can use my hands. Yeah. Myself, I like to hunt out of a blind and uh, typically I'll use a slate and get them all the way into where I need them. Uh, if there needs to be anything uh, to finish them off, usually just a little bit of a scratch on that slate will get them close enough. How about you, Chris? Yeah, I tried them all. I'll use a slate, you know, if I'm in the blind. If I'm just walking out, you know, calling, I like the diaphragm, especially with my, my bow because it's just hands-free. All right. Next, next topic. When you're when you're calling, uh, and the, the bird's coming in, and he gets out there a little ways, and it hangs up. Uh, a, a lot of the new new turkey hunters want to keep calling to bring it in, because as long as you call, he'll answer. But in in nature, the hen goes to the tom, not the other way around. So if you stop calling once you, you see him, you stop. Just be quiet for thirty minutes. He will get fed up, up and he'll come to you and, and you, you'll be, a, you'll have a better shot. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. The other thing with, um, I forgot there was uh, somebody asked uh, before we get too far past it, how do you pick a grain for your broadheads? Um, somebody's asking about, you know, what's, what grain broadheads do you use? Um, can you guys get a little bit more specific about that? Maybe Robert, uh, giving a recommendation that, you know, most, most broadheads come in a hundred or 125 grain um, size. Is there a preference for those? Um, the preference is, is what shoots best out of your bow. Um, remember though, when you do change weights, um, say you're practicing shooting with a hundred grain and you go to 125 grain broadhead, that changes some of your spine too. So that'll affect some of your flight. So if you're if you're shooting 100 grain for your your practice and you know, your field points, use 100 grain broad, broadhead also, and that way it keeps the spine of the arrow in. But they all work very well, and you just have to choose which one does best. Okay. And somebody asked, how do you what targets do you use when you're practicing with the guillotine? Can't say I've never used a broadhead, so I don't know what I would shoot at. <laughs> What would you use, Chris? I don't know. I haven't started shooting with it yet. I, I don't know if it would go just fine into your standard, you know, block target, or if it would get all mangled. I, I don't know that answer. Yeah. Well, it's hard to say because uh, you don't want to mess up. I, I don't know how they come in the package, the guillotines. I haven't bought any yet. It comes with, with looks like three total. So I'm assuming you. You ruin one practicing and you got two to go. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, in that case, you'll have to ruin that uh, that thing. You don't want to lose it still at the same time because even the arrow itself costs a lot of money. If, you, um, if you're going to shoot that guillotine broadhead, uh, uh, a good soft sand pit works. You shoot it into a, a what we call, a, a, back in the day, we called it a, a broadhead pit. It'd be a, a pit full of sand. Uh -huh. it, 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 it would work and do less damage. It dull that dull up the, you know the, the, the edges, but you can either resharpen them. Uh, but it, 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 the sand would give. It wouldn't give too much resistance to where it would bend up the blades. Good. Thank you. Uh, somebody mentioned a cheap pillow you don't care too much about works with the guillotines. Okay, that's that's a good recommendation. Make a mess with feathers too, right? <laughs> All right, let's talk about turkey decoys and blinds. Uh, if somebody's just starting turkey hunting, what kind of decoys should they consider getting? Do you need to have like a whole flock? Uh, do you buy a big tom? Uh, what what's 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 the minimum, and what's the preferred? Uh, the minimum would be at least the hen. Um, if you have a second uh, a choice. Um, a young Tom or a Jake, um, and then you could add from there. You can make it really simple um, to get you started, uh, but you need at least a, a hen as a bare minimum. I I agree with I agree with uh, uh, Robert. Uh, and if you buy a hen, uh, you they have one that's, that's that's on the ground that's 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 in the uh, uh, bread position. 
that really fires up the, the, the tongs when they come in, especially if they see a Jake you know, uh, trying, trying to breed her. Yeah, I, I would I would say the same thing, guys. Uh, that submissive hand that looks like it's uh, ready to accept breeding, and having a Jake decoy, which uh, a Jake decoy like this one in the in our uh, presentation here, that's kind of like Jake uh, Tomish. The shorter the beard, the closer to a Jake and less dominant uh, Tom it looks like. Um, myself, I have a pair of wings that I used from an old turkey that I shot that I saddle over the top of this decoy. It makes it look like it's uh, strutting and somewhat uh, being, uh, um, I don't know, just this gives them a strutting look. So uh, I find that to be a really effective tool. The more realistic you can make it look more lively, probably the better your decoy will be. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's legal to use parts of birds as, as decoys. Some people use mounted ones even. Um, let me see. Blinds, let's talk about blinds. Uh, you can see one here in the background. Do you guys use a uh, hub style like this or do you prefer open stake blinds? Um, I've used both. Um, I have a, a tent like that one, um, but it, sometimes I've just gone out with a, some netting and put it in between two trees or two sticks and then kind of brush it in. Um, in that situation, then a recurve and a longbow works very well because you don't have to worry about a top on it. And, uh, but they're both, for me, I use both, depends on the situation. If you, if you have pre-scouted pre an area that you want to hunt and you know the routine of, of, of the birds or the turkeys, uh, setting up in a hub style blind is, is perfect because you can sit there and, and, and wait on them and, and, and especially if you got a, a youngster with you that you introduce them to, to archery, they can sit there and, and move around and it won't spook the birds. If you're running and gunning the way they talked about, you know, or, or where we talked about running and gunning, uh, maybe the, the hub blind might be a little heavy to carry around. So the, the, uh, the just uh, sitting behind some bushes or with your back to a tree or whatever is, uh, is preferred. Yeah, we mentioned a little bit too, some of the, dangers of using a hub style um, blind, having it set up the night be day before, or maybe set up the whole season. Uh, some considerations you might want to uh, take care of be would be, sorry, my dog is howling in the background. It sounds like OR93. I don't know what's going on, <clears throat> but uh, gosh, sorry about that. Um, in your, in your blind, if you leave it out, you leave it set up, some of the things, you'll be going to that blind early in the morning before sun up. You might want to look inside and check inside the blind to make sure there's no snakes, no critters in there that's got in there through, in the middle of the night. No skunks. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, making sure that your floor is free of any uh, noise, any rattlesnakes. Uh, you will encounter rattlesnakes at this time of year. Uh, coming out of their dance. So be aware that any nice covered blind area might be uh, just as comfortable for a snake as it would for you. Um, Chris, do you have any recommendations on blind issues? Yeah, I mean, if you're on public land, you're gonna be hiking a long ways. You wanna take into consideration the weight. Some blinds weigh more than others. You know, if I'm hiking BLM, I'm not gonna bring a blind if I have my bow i'm gonna try and sit behind some trees to block me um but i definitely like something in front of me when i have my bow um to mask that movement whether it be a blind or a tree or you know sticks like robert said um, with some mesh or something on it yeah and the other thing is you, you want to make sure you don't backlight yourself either uh to where there's um your silhouette shows your movement um very easily so make sure you have some type of cover behind you, not just in front of you, but behind you so that your movement is uh, blocked by cover. All right, uh, let's go on to the next topic, shot placement. We've had some questions on this already come in in regards to shot placement. Uh, Robert, do you wanna lead on, on some of this? Do you have any preference for any of these shot placements? Or you know, when it comes to harvesting a turkey, uh, what's been most effective for you? Um, 
if you were to, if you were to label those what you already have have up there, uh, one and two, and then um, actually all of them except the one walking away uh, that's not fanned. Um, I've had shots about all those right there, and it worked out. Those are good points that you you've got uh, highlighted there. Yes. Uh... Here I have practice, 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 and it's not just standing and shooting at a, a practice target. You should always assume the position you're most likely to be shooting when you're hunting. So you might even want to set up your blind and shoot from the stool that you're going to be carrying out into the field. Um, know your effective range. Uh, your effective range is reduced a lot of times with some of the, um, the guillotine type of heads. Um, Know your effective range, right? And if you have to, pass on the shot if need be. If you don't have a good clean shot, pass on it. Uh, maybe the bird will work on, uh, keep on working, and you'll you'll get that shot that you want. Don't be rushed. Uh, the hunt is only successful if you can uh, harvest that bird. So taking a, a shot that's not um, advised would be. Um, would be something you don't want to do. Now, anybody, uh, can anybody tell me that there's a shot up there that you don't want to take? If you numbered those from uh, one through six, uh, with the one being the top left and the bottom, uh, bottom right being number six, which one would not be a safe one to take? Anybody have any comments in the chat? Let me see. Uh, I've seen this, uh, number five, number three, nope. Somebody has to see the answer. Number one, Jonathan, you got that right. The, there's, if you look at slide number one up there, there's two turkeys. There's one behind the first one, and you wanna make sure your target is clear both in front and beyond your intended target. So that one, you could result possibly in two turkeys with one shot. Uh, Gina, you got it right too, number one. Uh, th that's the one you'd have to wait a little bit, wait for that opportunity to present itself where one turkey is there in, in your, uh, your view. All right, number, let's go on to the next one. Next slide, recovering your prize. Have you guys ever lost a turkey? Johnny? Yes. Robert? Uh, not yet. Wow, lucky guy. <laughs> Chris? Yeah. I have two, okay? And I have even lost turkeys and still got poison oak. Um, you, a lot of times, the hunt areas that you're in for turkey will have poison oak in them, and they know that that's good cover. Uh, so be prepared um, for poison oak. Uh, it might not be as obvious right now. Uh, sometimes it's still a little sticks with barely some leafing coming out. Uh, but be prepared after your hunt to, to change any clothes you may have. Be prepared with a change of clothes and any of these materials that sometimes um, they, uh, you know, help you getting that Urashal oil off of your, off of your uh, body. So anyways. Um, Anything else? Uh, what do you have for recommendations for turkey recovering turkeys? Jeremy, have you uh, had any issues? Or recommendations? If you don't make a good clean kill. If you don't make a good clean kill, uh, hunt until you until you sure you can't find it. You know, uh, you you don't want to never give up. Uh, when you're looking for a, a, a wounded turkey. Uh, he's not going to be standing up. He's going to be laying down and hunkered down to the ground. So make, make sure you, you put your gaze down to the ground and he's going to be tucked under something. So uh, be looking for that. Robert, you have any uh, situation where you've lost? You know, the reason I uh, mentioned this too is because most situations when you're hunting big game, such as deer or pigs or something with a bow, uh, you want to give them that 20 minutes to, uh, you know, for the for the animal to um, hemorrhage and bleed out. Um, is is that necessarily the case with the wild turkey? Uh, it could be in some cases. Uh, depends on on what you thought you hit. 
Um, one thing that, that I pay attention to, uh, like John mentioned, is, is look low and look under stuff, is looking for feathers. If, if you have, if the arrow's in it or it went through, there's gonna be some feathers left. So you can keep a lookout on that um, or where they go into a bush, they may drag some out into the limb, just like if you were blood trailing, there would be blood there. There may be feathers there too. So uh, just don't give up, keep looking, and but get low to the ground because they will find you know the nastiest hole. And for you, Sean, you know all the poison oak. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's exactly. How about you, Chris? Have you had any uh, situations with you know that you found a turkey after looking for a while or? Um, yeah, kinda. I had two. One I shot it a little high, blew feathers off it. But the thing with archery that I found is the two turkeys that I've hit high didn't really run off because there was no bang from a shotgun. So the first one I shot high, hit feathers, it ran about 20 yards. I got a second shot on, second shot missed, tracked it, never found that bird. But another bird that I shot just a tad bit high, went the opposite way, turned and came running back straight towards me. I was able to get a second shot, you know, facing me and then dropped it right where it was standing. So I've noticed that they, they don't go very far on an archery shot if they don't really know where you're at. Um, but yeah, I have lost one bird before. Couldn't find it. Okay. Um, I think that covers most of our stuff. I'm going to address some questions that came in on the question and answer. Uh, is there a fall season decoy strategy? Uh, have you guys hunted for turkeys using decoys in the fall? I have once. I just use more decoys because they tend to be more flocked up. Mm -hmm. Um, few more hens than normal but uh you know half a dozen or so i've uh i've never used a decoy in the fall uh because usually uh, the turkeys are the, the young what do you call them popes the, the young turkeys are they're all in a big group and if you it's been my experience or how i hunt if i see a group i i run at that group you know to try to, to try to disperse them and then i'll set up Right there where they where they dispersed from i'll set up then i'll give them the key key run which is the lost lost bird run and they'll all try to get uh, gather right back at that spot and they'll coming in one and two at a time and presents a better shot yep yeah um we didn't go into types of calls but if if you look into that um key key um is the sound that a turkey makes um, I've heard it being effective in the fall where you, like Johnny said, you go out and disrupt the flock and you bring this key key call back. It kind of calls them back in as a gathering call and uh, um, it, it tends to be effective. Um, let's see, some other questions that came in. Advantages or disadvantages of saddle hunting from a tree. I don't know if that's maybe a stand that they're talking the, about. The, the, the saddle hunting, that's, that's, well, it's not new, but it's, it's, it's coming back now. It's very popular. The, the, the saddle hunting is like hunting from a, it's hunting from a tree stand. And the, but, the, but the only disadvantage for that is you're, you're stationary and it's hard to move around. If, you, if the birds are, are, you know, are coming close to you, you can't get shot. But it's hard to move around with a, with a, with a, saddle, with a saddle or a tree stand. That's one of the biggest disadvantages. Okay. Um, shot, this one's a comment kind of uh, shot placement. I understand a high poundage bow, you should go for a leg shot if you know it's going to be a through and through. Would, would that be a recommendation? I like to, when I shoot, I like to try to visualize where the drumstick is on a turkey. I come up the leg, visualize the drumstick, and I, I like to shoot right at the top of the drumstick. Uh, if you can show that you shoot right where the drumstick would be, I like to aim from right there because if you hit the, the drumstick or the right there at the top where it connects, you take the legs away from that turkey and uh, he can't, he won't be able to run off. And for him to fly, he has to jump up in the air before he, before he flaps his wings and he can't do that. So you have a better chance at, uh, at recovery. Gotcha. All right. Um, what is the optimum range for your shot? And I think that's kind of subjective, but we talked about effective range earlier. And optimum range, effective range, to me, those are kind of synonymous. Uh, it's the range at which you're very consistent with your shot, that you're not taking a chance. It's not like a 
50 50 shot it's an 80 percent you know shot or better that you you're able to make so that to me would be your optimum range for shot um you know it's all about shot placement and being proficient for the range that you're shooting at so that would be optimum range is whatever you're your uh you're proficient at um one question on average how far does it do you have to track a bird after a decent shot um sometimes you know nowhere right right if you get a a decent shot on a bird uh he drops right there in sight you know there's no tracking it no tracking at all yep okay. and i have seen turkeys where i shot them uh they knocked knocked them completely over on their sides they got up and started running away. I saw them at a hundred yard distance where they ran into some poison oak and uh, I gave them a little bit of time before I went over there and I tried to track them. And you have to understand turkeys don't bleed like big game animals. They, uh, they don't leave a whole swath of blood that you can track. Any blood that does come out of them is quickly absorbed by the feathers that are on the turkey. So you're not gonna see much tracking uh, you may hopefully see find uh, wet grass uh, if it's early in the morning. That might help you uh, track a turkey, where you can see where the wet grass has been disrupted. Um, uh, not maybe some feathers, but really you're not going to see too much in the way of blood. Um, so that that'll happen. Uh, somebody's asking about uh, what are some things to look for when e scouting a spot. Um, E-scouting for turkeys, I don't know if that's really an effective way. Um, you want to do find some areas that are good for strutting. So maybe uh, areas that are not too steep, right? Uh, what, what else would you guys have for habitat of a turkey? What, what does somebody want to look for e-scouting? Well, uh, I go, what you said about the clear area, because the tom gets out there in the morning and, and struts. So it's usually a flat open area. Or if it's on the hillside, it's still open. Um, but uh, you can look for areas where uh, they would scratch for, uh, for like the toms like to dust themselves. And, and uh, 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 yes, and of course, uh, possibly areas where you think a, a hen might be be laying for you know for 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 um, her nest. You know, you don't want to hunt the, the, the nest, but the toms will be coming in close. So, you know, if they've got weeds about the knee high. Mm -hmm. All right. So those are things, and we will talk about e-scouting at some point later, uh, mostly in regards to a big game. I probably will have e-scouting in August as a clinic. Um, really quick, I want to close this out with a couple of polls. Um, here's a lot, one of the last ones. Why would you choose to archery hunt for turkey? Um, new challenge, prefer archery over firearms or opens up more opportunities, private land and longer season. Why would you choose to hunt archery, uh, archery hunt for turkey? All right, I'm gonna close it in uh, five seconds. And three, two, one. So everybody is looking up for uh, more opportunities because archery should afford you more opportunities. Besides the longer season, you may get access to private land that uh, doesn't like the, I'm sharing your results now, that doesn't like uh, the use of firearms around their uh, house, either because of them, their house or they wanna have, stay friendly with their neighbors who don't like hunting. So you may be able to get archery uh, um, access over firearms. Um, so yeah, so the new challenge was a uh, 40%, 44 responded, 21% um, said, I mean, 19% said they prefer archery over firearms and 55% said uh, opening up new opportunities for private land in a longer season. So good. Thank you for that one. One more before we, or two more before we leave. This is a one I'd like to see. How far are we, you willing to travel for an opportunity to hunt turkeys? Zero to 60 miles, 60 to 120, <clears throat> 120 plus miles. Curious how much turkeys mean to you guys and gals. 
And actually, it seems like they mean a lot. We're going to close this in uh, three, two, one. You might be interested in this. A lot of you said that you'd be willing to char travel over 120 miles for a turkey. So either you live in areas there are no turkeys and you have to travel that far, or uh, you really like your turkeys. Um, I have to travel about 120 miles or I, well, to get to the spot that I go normally. I think I have turkeys living within 60 miles of me. So I'd be, uh, I've gone all of those distances. I guess it depends on your opportunity. And the last one for tonight is have you ever shot a bow on a field course? Um, the reason I'm asking this is because Johnny and uh, Robert belong to a, a, a field archery club. And we're just curious how uh, much your archery, uh, you take your archery serious. Um, Field archery, field courses are very fun. It's like playing golf on the weekend. You get out there with your bow and you're trying to hit a target, just like hitting a golf ball into the cup. And if you haven't done it before, I recommend that you find a club and try it. So here's the end poll and sharing results. 57% said they have shot a field course and 43% haven't. So if you haven't, give it a try. You'll find that it's very relaxing and enjoyable. And uh, people like Johnny and Robert um, have belong to clubs that help you do that. And uh, you can have a great time. So anything uh, you guys want to add to our end of our webinar tonight? Uh, I'd just like to mention that when people are out practicing and shooting their broadheads and stuff like that, to think of a smaller target. Uh, try to shoot smaller spots or something uh, that gets you a little bit focused. And if it's out there and, and, and your first thought is, is I think I can make the shot, you probably should because you, you've already put doubt in your mind on that shot. So if it's something he says, yeah, I've made the shot, I can do this, where you have more confidence, you're probably going to be more successful. Okay. Johnny, any closing remarks? Uh, no, I... Uh... I hope everybody has, 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 has learned a lot or learned something new if they didn't learn a lot and uh, good turkey hunting. All right. And Chris, anything to add? Yeah, I would just say if you guys have questions, get a hold of your local fish and game office and ask to talk to a warden in a certain area and they'll be able to point you to whoever that warden is and pick our brains, ask us questions, laws, where to hunt, if you can hunt there. Um, We'll answer everything we can for you guys all right well thank you again everybody for attending uh we still have a pretty good attendance i think you all stuck with us and uh sorry to hold you over a little bit longer but uh we really love sharing this information with you please be sure to check us out um for other uh, webinars coming up i will send you a links page that'll give you some more information to research on this topic enjoy those links and uh Good luck out there and wish me luck. I'm going turkey hunting next weekend. So hopefully we'll have something to report next time. All right. Well, that's it. Uh, good night. And we'll talk to you again later. Thanks, Sean. Thank you. Thank you. So are we out? Yep.